Good morning. The committee will come to order. I thank everyone for joining us this morning. I want to especially thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, we all know how much the internet has changed our lives, but the most dramatic impact it may have had is the opportunities it has provided small businesses. 20 years ago, there was no Google, YouTube, or Facebook. Companies that started small but eventually turned into major brands. Much of this is made possible by the internet and its ability to connect people in ways unheard of just a short time ago, allowing small businesses to compete with larger competitors. One of the first ways small businesses utilize the internet to start and grow a business was through a use of digital platforms. Digital platforms facilitate commercial interactions between suppliers on one end and consumers on the other. Whether it is reaching consumers out of arm's reach or hiring someone to cover a shift, digital platforms stretch tight budgets and make small businesses much more efficient. As the online economy evolves, digital platforms are growing into networks referred to as digital ecosystems, where stakeholders and consumers are tied together by digital services that foster information sharing and collaboration. These communal environments have become the catalyst for modern business models like the gig economy and the next generation of digital marketing. The gig economy term used to describe an emerging labor marketplace defined by flexible temporary work arrangements is changing the way Americans view work. Through digital platforms like the ones that are represented by our witnesses today, small businesses can hire talent for short-term projects and benefit from a vast network of unbundled services. Skilled and creative solopreneurs like web developers and event planners can also use digital platforms to be hired by consumers and other small business owners. In fact, 70% of U.S. small businesses have hired a gig worker, and 50% currently have at least one currently working. As a result, 43% of businesses hire gig workers are saving at least 20% in labor costs. Digital platforms can also help small businesses reach bigger audiences. In the traditional market space, small firms must compete with big businesses for expensive ad space. Digital marketing levels the playing field by lowering costs and expanding impact. Data sharing within digital ecosystems also make it easier for small businesses to reach niche audiences because advertisements are targeted to customers of similar businesses. This competitive advantage and cost savings enable small businesses to scale and thrive. However, many small firms are being left behind. In fact, even today, a third of small businesses still do not have functioning websites and 42% believe that the internet is not relevant to their business. Unfortunately, many small businesses view digital adoption as a luxury instead of a key driver for success. As technology rapidly develops, the digital ecosystem is only going to become more digitally ingra or no, more deeply ingrained rather in business and everyday life. Today, there are 2.5 billion people connected to the internet, and there will be twice as many connected by 2020. Studies have found that 80% of companies that have embraced digital adoption have increased profits by 85%. These increased profit margins can mean the difference between failure and survival. America's small businesses cannot afford to be left behind. So I hope that today's discussion will shed light on the many ways digital platforms benefit small businesses and encourage broader adoption of digital tools. Small businesses must join the digital ecosystem to grow and thrive. I thank each of the witnesses for joining us here today, and I look forward to your testimony. I would now like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Balderson, for his opening statement. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to join you for our subcommittee's inaugural hearing this morning. Uh, good morning to all of you, and a special thank you to our witnesses for taking your time out of your busy day uh, to join us. The use of technolo digital technology is gaining popularity with small firms because of the opportunities it creates for small businesses to compete and succeed in a rapidly changing market. Smaller businesses can only compete with their larger corporate counterparts by acting swiftly and adapting to these demands produced by our increasingly digital modern world. Technology innovation is a critical component of this development and a sequential advantage. As businesses adapt mobile computing devices and software, such as cloud computing systems and online conference calls, employees and key stakeholders are enabled to communicate and collaborate around the world in real time. 
Such innovations reduce travel cost, drastically improve efficiency, and eliminate barriers for startups. Perhaps the greatest benefit of adapting new technologies is the resulting financial savings. As evidenced by the past few decades, technology, digital technology increases productivity, reduces overhead cost, and gives businesses a leg up on their competition. Increasingly, tool, digital tools and platforms serve as the foundation of modern American small businesses. Small firms that use digital tools are more nimble, resourceful, and better equipped to engage potential customers. In fact, it's been proven that digital-powered businesses earn twice the revenue as those that don't and are three times more likely to create new jobs than non-digital firms. The goal of today's hearing is to learn how Congress can unlock the vast potential of our nation's small business economy. I look forward to the discussion and further examination of how technology enables small businesses to succeed. Again, I thank my colleague, Chairman Crow, for the holding this important hearing and for our friendship. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Balderson. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, and if committee members have an opening statement uh, prepared, we'd ask that they be submitted for the record at this time. I would like to just take a minute to explain the timing rules for all of you. Uh, each witness gets five minutes to testify, and the members get five minutes for questioning each. Uh, there is a lighting system to assist you. The, those are the buttons that you see in front of you. The green light will be on when you begin, and the yellow light comes on when you have one minute remaining. The red light comes on when you're out of time, and we ask that you stay within that time frame to the best of your ability. Uh, I would now like to introduce our first witness, Ms. Kellen Blossom. Uh, Ms. Kellen Blossom is the head of public policy at Thumbtack. Here, Ms. Blossom focuses on advocating for small businesses across the country. Ms. Blossom also served as director of West Coast Public Policy at Uber and associate director of intergovernmental affairs in the Obama White House. Before the Obama administration, Ms. Blossom served the Department of Homeland Security and worked on several congressional campaigns. Ms. Blossom received a bachelor's degree from Brown University and a Master of Public Administration from Harvard University, the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Welcome, Ms. Blossom. Our next witness is Mrs. Olivia Omega Wallace, a resident of Aurora, Colorado, our, our hometown. Mrs. Omega Wallace is a brand consultant and speaker, co-founder of the Wallace Marketing Group, Denver Director of Brazen Global and author of Beautifully Branded, the Girl's Guide to Personal Branding and Understanding the Anatomy of Brand You. Inspiring women entrepreneurs is her passion. Olivia helps, create, uh, helps women create authentically unique brands through messaging, identity, and brand experiences. Mrs. Omega Wallace is a graduate of the University of Colorado at Boulder, Leeds School of Business, and has 15 years of corporate branding, advertising, and digital marketing experiences. Welcome, Mrs. Omega Wallace. Our third witness is Ms. Erica Moses. Ms. Erica Moses is a co-founder and chief operating officer at Hire. Prior to co-founding Hire in 2015, Ms. Moses worked as a public affairs executive and senior communications professional in government and on political campaigns. Ms. Moses received an honors degree in political science from Western University. Welcome, Ms. Erica Moses. Ms. Blossom, uh, we'll start with you. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Crow, for the opportunity to speak before you today. My name is Kellen Blossom, and I lead public policy for Thumbtack. We are honored to be a part of this discussion to share our perspective on how technology can empower America's small businesses. Thumbtack is a website and an app that connects customers looking to hire service professionals to hundreds of thousands of small businesses. Now over 10 years old, Thumbtack facilitates millions of connections every year. These customers can find small businesses in nearly a thousand different categories, from plumbers and personal trainers to caterers and cat groomers. Thumbtack was created to solve one of the biggest challenges facing new small businesses. A Thumbtack survey found that 43% of small businesses say that the number one concern for their business is finding the right customers. For independent businesses, finding the next client is a constant concern. 
Thumbtack solves that problem by connecting customers looking for services to the small businesses that provide those services in their area. We haven't created new categories of work. Instead, we use new technology to grow and expand the reach of small business professionals that have existed for decades and make their work more efficient. On Thumbtack, there are three features that are particularly valuable to the small businesses that are looking to grow. First, each small business that signs up on Thumbtack gets to create their own online profile that they can fill with information about their business, a story about how they get started, pictures of their work, and contact information. This profile can be found directly on Thumbtack, but even more importantly, it can be found through Google searches or other online search engines. This is crucial for small businesses who may not have an online presence, including the 35% of small businesses who feel that their business is not large enough to justify having their own website. Second, Thumbtack makes it easy for new customers to find reviews from past customers. While they are not a perfect measure, customer reviews have become a key factor that consumers expect and rely on when purchasing products or hiring businesses. In fact, surveys have found that over 90% of consumers age 18 to 34 trust online reviews just as much as they trust personal recommendations. And third, Thumbtack provides crucial insights to small businesses about how they stack up in their market. We give them data on how other businesses in the area are pricing their services and how many customers are searching in their category so they can quickly understand the dynamics in their industry and market their services competitively. These features help small businesses grow their business on their own terms. Because too often technology businesses claim to be changing the game and revolutionizing the future of work by simply providing what amount to be often on-demand minimum wage jobs. While these can be great transitional opportunities, they rarely allow individuals to build a business or expand their earning potential. Thumbtack focuses on giving individuals the digital tools to build not just a job, but a career and a business that can scale. We often see professionals on Thumbtack start out as a sole proprietor and eventually add employees and add services as they grow. And we think that technology can play a role in addressing other challenges that small and independent businesses face, like the challenge of accessing benefits. Earlier this year, Thumbtack was proud to become the first marketplace company to provide workers access to truly portable benefits through a partnership with the National Domestic Workers Alliance and their ALEA platform. The partnership uses a digital platform to create accounts that independent workers can use to access paid time off and insurance products. While the pilot is still in its very early stages, we're optimistic that we can learn important insights that we can share with policymakers. So together, we can work to help small businesses and independent workers close the benefits gap. But our business is about more than just numbers and data points and pilots and projects. It's about people. It's about people like Terrell King from Washington State. Terrell had spent decades in the service industry, but he was struggling to get by. He signed up to work for a big cleaning agency, but he wasn't making enough money to support his family. Frustrated and out of ideas, he turned to a family member who told him about Thumbtack. He created his own profile that evening with a picture and a story about why he loved doing his work. And that first day, he found a customer for a high paying job. Within four months, Terrell went from barely making ends meet to having his own thriving cleaning business, paying off his bills, and even bringing on employees to keep up with the demand. Terrell was able to use technology to take control of his own career and build a small business that he's proud of. People like Terrell are the reason that Thumbtack exists, and we believe technology is at its best when it empowers people to achieve their own dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blossom. You, you had that perfectly timed, too. <laughs> A lot of pressure, Ms. Moses. <laughs> you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Grow. And thank you for having me here during National Small Business Week, throughout which we honor the small businesses and entrepreneurs that are central to our economy and to our communities. My name is Erica Moses, and I'm the co-founder and chief operating officer at Hire. I'm here to speak with you about the importance of the entrepreneurial spirit as it relates to the freelance economy and how this new economy is providing economic mobility for millions of Americans. The structure of work, which we support through the higher platform, allows hospitality and retail workers to freelance and earn extra income and portable benefits. Workers like Megan. Megan began working hospitality shifts through hire in the weeks leading up to Christmas. 
After the holidays, she sent us a heartwarming message sharing that she joined Hire to earn extra money for Christmas presents her daughter wanted most. And because of Hire, she was able to gift those presents to her daughter. But even better, after just three weeks of working th shifts through Hire, a company she worked with through Hire offered her a full-time job. And workers like Mandy. Mandy said Hire allows her to schedule freedom. Before joining Hire, Mandy found it difficult to work in the hospitality industry while starting off her career as an actress. Because of last minute audition calls, she would have to call off from her job or beg coworkers to, to cover her shift. But with Hire, she was able to pick up and choose sh shifts that best fit her schedule. At Hire, we help workers connect with businesses that are looking to fill any shift at any time. This helps both workers and small businesses alike. My co-founder and I understand both sides of this equation all too well. As hourly paid hospitality workers at one point in our careers, there were just too many times that we experienced too much month at the end of the money. And later in our careers, when we both worked on the business side, we struggled to find great workers given to that today's just ever shallowing labor pool. To help close the gap, we created a worker-focused platform that connects the two parties. Gig workers on the hire platform are typically already working a full-time or part-time job within the hospitality or retail sectors, but are looking to learn a little bit, earn a little bit of extra money on the side through our platform. And at Hire, we ensure workers receive those earnings within three days after they work their shift. But more importantly, we created a form of portable benefits called U-Points for gig workers that accumulate every time they work a shift through Hire. We built the system to address the issues many gig workers face while they choose to enter the freelance economy. We did this because a growing number of Americans are choosing work that is just not nine to five. Instead, they are your Hire Pro, they're your Uber driver, or they're your Grubhub food deliverer. The gig economy has become a central cog in America's economic growth engine, providing both entry-level opportunities and supplemental incomes. At Hire, we set out to fill a massive gap for businesses. Access to talented workers fast and relief from high turnover and call-offs. With same-day availability, businesses post shifts on our mobile app by highlighting their specific need, location, hourly rate of pay, and more. They review skilled and, and rated workers who apply for those shifts and they choose the workers that best fit their need. And we set out to fill a massive gap for today's gig worker. Flexible schedules, supplemental income, and portable benefits that, again, we call youth points. Gig workers created their higher profile in minutes by highlighting their particular expertise, their work history, their hourly rate of pay, and their availability. And they're notified of available shifts that meet their need, and then they apply for the shifts that they interest them most. At the conclusion of each shift, earnings are directly deposited in the worker's bank account within three business days. While it can be tempting to view the gig economy as either primarily beneficial or primarily detrimental, there's still a really large gray area. And businesses like Hire are thinking about broader policy questions, like how we help freelancers access more traditional benefits. At Hire, we strive to bring opportunities and, and opportunities and individuals together, and all businesses, but especially small businesses, would benefit from a modernized system that more easily allows individuals who wish to work independently to, contact, to connect with organizations in need of talent. For this reason, we have engaged with the Coalition for Workforce Innovation to promote federal policies that allow the connections to create between organizations and individuals accessible for all platforms, industries, and positions. The fact is, the number of gig opportunities are growing at unprecedented rates, and technology companies like ours have made it easier for workers and businesses to find each other. By staying flexible, collaborating with each other, and balancing innovation with the tried and true, we can position ourselves to adapt and thrive in this new gig economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moses. Uh, Mrs. Omega Wallace, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Crow, Ranking Member Baldison. My name is Olivia Omega Wallace, an entrepreneur and a marketing consultant with 20 years of experience in branding and advertising. I live in Aurora, Colorado, and I'm the co-founder of Wallace Marketing Group. My husband and I and three contractors started Wallace Marketing Group specifically to help coaches and, and consultants in the health, wellness, fitness, and nutrition industry to grow their companies through branding, online marketing, and digital communications. Over the past two decades, I've seen the evolution of marketing happen before our eyes on the internet. 
the many barriers to entry started to diminish as technology increased, allowing individuals with no special advantages take an idea, quickly bring it to market, hire employees, and scale with less upfront out-of-pocket out costs and less risk. Our clients include a vegan chef and a naturopathic doctor, husband and wife team. They want to bring healthy living um, and easy cooking to their local and online global communities. We also have a counselor that offers art therapy to, to families in trauma. Online marketing tools allow them to reach their specific target audience from Aurora to Australia. I started my first business making and selling stuffed animals as a teenager. And at that time, the internet, again, 20 plus, 20, 30 years ago, the internet and other online resources weren't available. It's incredible to look at young people today, such as our daughter, who has a business of her own. She's a sophomore in high school and has published three murder mystery novels for middle schoolers. She's pursuing her dreams early in life. This has been made possible by online publishing, payment, and marketing platforms that we as entrepreneurs and small business owners use every single day. She's releasing her fourth book later this year thanks to the many digital resources at her fingertips. Terms like post engagement, community insights, cost per click, page views, shared pins, retweets, channel subscribers, page boosts and video views are household names for us. Whether I'm searching for the perfect contractor on Upwork, teaching a workshop to 100 women entrepreneurs on how to leverage Facebook ads to grow their business, or coaching a client one-on-one -on, -one on the importance of consistent content to grow their YouTube channel, the ability to participate fully and make a living as a small business or entrepreneur would be impossible without these online business tools. So I'm here today to advocate for all of those small businesses, solo entrepreneurs, all of those independent artists, writers and creators, all entrepreneurs who are using the internet and the free flow of data that it offers us to bring their vision to the world. Privacy and security are critical to both our family and our business, but achieving these ends must be done in a way that preserves the magic of commerce as well as the community that brought us to this point. When I hear the phrase, it's, per it's not personal, it's business, I kind of laugh to myself. Our family is helping our clients provide for their family, um, whether it's through online marketing or social media. So for us, it's always personal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Omega Wallace, appreciate that. We appreciate the testimony all of you have shared, and I'm gonna begin by uh, recognizing myself uh, for five minutes. Um, starting uh, with uh, Ms. Omega Wallace, uh, you know, we heard earlier that not all small businesses have websites. In fact, a lot of them don't even think that it's relevant uh, to their businesses. And I'd, I'd love for you to share with us in your experience working with other entrepreneurs, why, uh, you know, what, what, A, what are the barriers to getting those websites up and uh, having the, the tech, uh, technological savvy? And uh, B, why do some don't, don't think that it's even relevant for their businesses? When we think about entrepreneurs, let's take a local baker, for example. They love to bake. That's what they know how to do. And so adding something like a website mm. to their day-to-day, -day, um, they think about the complications of putting it together, trying to find a web designer to help them do that, the cost of, of putting a website up. But I think the most overwhelming thing, which um, creates a barrier and why they might dismiss it, is that upkeep. So ongoing day-to-day, month-to-month, and even year-to-year, -year, they want to bake. And again, that's what they know how to do. So we're adding another piece of technology and an element of marketing that they may not understand to a long list of things that they have to do, including accounting and sales tax, um, et cetera. So it starts to become very overwhelming and therefore um, dismissing it altogether sometimes becomes the easiest thing in their mind. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Ms. Blossom, uh, you mentioned that Thumbtack is uh, different than other digital tools. Mm -hmm. And, then, and that you're not just providing a job, but helping people start businesses. Uh, and I'm, I'm really interested in creating pathways for new business ownership and entrepreneurship. And I'd love for you to uh, talk a little bit more about that. 
excuse me. Thanks. At Thumbtack, we really think that our job is to provide small businesses the tools to kind of scale and grow and fit what needs for them. Um, the businesses that are using Thumbtack are able to uh, uh, set their budgets and you know reach out to as many customers as they like. But we really think that it's up to them. Um, it's We're not about limiting their opportunity. We often see people that will start out and they're just one person. Um, they're a dog trainer, you know, training dogs, but then as they get more demand and they get more customers from Thumbtack, they bring on additional people and they expand into other services um, so that they can really grow, but they still have control over how they grow. And one of the things that we're really proud of is it really allows people to expand their earning opportunity um, you know, you may start out at a lower uh, rate that you're charging customers to try and get more customers in the door, but as you're getting more and more demand, you may raise your prices and you may be more selective about the type of customers that you want um, because you have control of your own business, mm -hmm. and we think that that's really important. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Moses, um, uh, we talked earlier about the, the gig economy, and from your perspective, uh, First, how is the gig economy defined, right? Because I think about a lot of kind of cottage industry and uh, you know, mom and pop uh, stores and shops and other things. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we define that and how it's impacting the small business uh, environment. It's a great question. And I, I think the first thing is the definition of the gig economy itself, where we see that as it's a free market system, which temp positions are common and companies contract with independent workers for short-term engagements. Um, in terms of how it's impacting small business, I think that's still to de be defined, frankly, because you're seeing you're seeing products like ours that are coming about and helping small businesses connect with workers when they need them most, but we're still relatively new. Mm -hmm. And you guys probably are aware of the other gig economy um, services that are out there, which have ride sharing or delivery. But if you're looking at delivery in particular for small businesses, you're thinking about that small restaurant that now is able to offer delivery, which is a whole other revenue stream for them that they didn't have previously. And it's helping them reach customers in areas that they haven't before. before. I think with hire, where we're breaking into that small business is when they only have five people in their restaurant and their dishwasher calls off, then they're, they have to turn down customers because they're not able to have people actually be able to wash the dishes. Now with hire, they could bring in that extra person for those labor costs that they truly need. Yeah. Thank you. And it seems like we can't have a conversation about uh, the gig economy and how this is changing without a discussion about the portability of benefits as well. Because people's relationship with work changes, then uh, the relationship with their, their health and retirement benefits changes as well. Uh, thank you. Um, so I will uh, now recognize Mr. Balderson uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and my first question is, is, is pretty broad, so it's to all three of you, if, if you all would like to jump in. I'm often surprised to learn when small business owners do not know how the Small Business Administration can help them as they start and grow their businesses. For example, I'm a co-sponsor of an important piece of legislation sponsored by Ranking Member Shabbat that would establish a program at the Small Business Development Center to provide cybersecurity training to all entrepreneurs. Programs offered to small business owners such as these aren't reaching their full potential if not enough business owners know and know about how to use them. Um, did any of you use any of these resources at the SBA or maybe at the SBDC? Uh, or did you advise any of your customers, as I would say, to, to reach out and, and to search out these uh, agencies and what they have to offer? And anybody can answer, so. Uh, yes, I have used um, some resources in the past, and I've advised um, some of my clients to do so as well. Um, you asked the question of why aren't they being used or utilized to its, their fullest. And I would say there's an overwhelming long list of um, items to check off for a business owner to start a business from registering um, their business name, trade name, registering their URL, et cetera. And I, I truly just believe that um, small business owners, solopreneurs starting out are overwhelmed. Um, and on the long list of things to do, they look at what do they absolutely have to do this minute on this day to get started. And um, things like cybersecurity training can fall by the wayside, unfortunately. Any else want to add? 
Sure, I think um, one of the things that we struggle with is there's often a misperception amongst the small businesses using our platform. The SBA, it, their only purpose is to provide loans. And a lot of the businesses on Thumbtack are not capital intensive because they're service businesses. You, you know, if you're a personal trainer, you might need a set of weights in a park to get started. And you, you, know, you might think that an SBA loan is not applicable for you. And so we're trying to educate um, the professionals using our site about all of the other services that SBA provides in terms of consulting, in terms of um, helping folks write a business plan beyond just the financial aspects um, to let them know the full reach of the agency. Okay, thank you. I, I think I would echo the same sentiment about just small business owners when they're first getting out. I know, I know when we first start, started, it was so overwhelming for us to do everything from creating the app itself, creating the technology, doing the website, thinking about actually just applying for um, a loan would just be very overwhelming for us. Uh, in terms of the workers on the higher platform, the majority of the workers on our platform are already working full-time or part-time within the industry, so they're only using hire as supplemental income, so that, that sort of benefit uh, would not apply to them, um, just because they are only picking up a few shifts a month. Okay, thank you all. <laughs> My next question is for Mrs. Wallace. Uh, I met with President Jake Ward and other members of the 3C team yesterday and who are also joining us here this morning. And one thing that we uh, discussed was the need for data privacy legislation. Um, in your opinion, what would this successful data privacy legislation entail? In my opinion, it would entail um, one overarching law or bill that small businesses can follow versus having to understand and comply to something state by state um, where most all digital and online um, businesses cross state lines and have clients all over the country. So that's what I would recommend. And that's a great recommendation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did anybody else want to add to that or? I would just second what um, Mrs. Yes. Omega Wall said. I, I know she, was, she, she nailed it. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you. The gentleman uh, yields back. Uh, I will now recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for allowing me to ask my questions a little bit out of order. Uh, my questions first are for Ms. Blossom and also Ms. Moses. Uh, you each spoke about something about portable benefits in your particular case and about points, a point system in your case for what amounts to portable benefits in health care. Can you give me a little bit more detail about how that is executed in each of your organizations and also how we as a Congress might be able to leverage that kind of idea to help people in a gig economy with portable benefits and such? Um, thanks. Uh, we're, we're so happy to talk about this topic. Um, earlier this year, we partnered with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, um, who have created an online platform called Alia, um, designed primarily for house cleaners. And the way that the platform <coughs> works is uh, cleaners can set up an account, and their customers can make contributions into their account that they can then use to uh, use the credits for a number of products, including paid time off, life insurance, disability insurance, and critical accident insurance. It's a st small step. Um, we know that it's not solving the full complement of benefits uh uh, challenges that workers face, um, but we think it's an important step to take um, to try and move the conversation forward and see what we can do. Um, as for what Congress can do, um, you know, there has been a bill from Congresswoman Del Bene on portable benefits to set up a pilot fund that would help uh, set up pilot projects in states and fund them. We think that that's a fantastic idea. Um, we don't claim to have all of the answers or solutions on how to do this yet, um, but we're openly looking for partners that are interested in solving this problem with us. Thank you, and Ms. Moses? It's a, it's a great question, and thank you for asking it. I think when we first looked at creating hire, one of the big things we wanted to do was because we have gig economy workers, was to create a system that we would be able to provide these benefits to them. Today, the way that the benefits look is they're called U-points, and within the U-points, uh, we collect money from the business, and we, we take a percentage of those earnings and we give them back to the workers in terms of a points-based system. What they're able to redeem those benefits for today is what we call a U-day. It's, it's essentially a $75 credit, which gives them a paid vacation day. Uh, by the end of this quarter, we're also going to be partnering with an, an insurance company, which would allow them to put those benefits towards insurance, so accident insurance. 
we would love to be able to explore options to also be able to provide uh, like that traditional healthcare benefit piece. Again, it's, it's looking for clarity among legislators as well uh, to figure out how we're able to do that within a gig economy work. But we do believe that the points-based system that we've created will allow workers to actually take part of their earnings like on addition because we're giving them these points in addition to what they're earning for their hourly wage and then decide where to allocate, allocate those to what matters most to them, whether it is insurance, a paid day off, health insurance, um, or other benefits that hopefully as we grow, we'll be able to add to the platform. So at this point in time, neither of you all have figured out how to crack the nut of health care insurance. Is that a fair statement? That's fair. We, uh, we know that a lot of the professionals on Thumbtack are using the ACA exchanges um, mm -hmm. to get their health insurance. Um, about a quarter of the professionals that started on Thumbtack said that benefits was the biggest challenge in making that leap to entrepreneurship. And about 14% of them directly attribute the ACA and them being able to start their own business. It's been a great step, um, but we know as premiums are increasing and it becomes a little bit harder to access that, that there's more work that we need to do there. So I actually did read in your testimony about the 14% attributing, you know, a, I guess assessing that as being a positive thing. It actually begs the question how many didn't think it was a positive thing. Was there a, a larger portion that didn't like the Affordable Care Act? Um, well, or did you ask that question? We didn't ask that question specifically, but because um, small businesses and professionals, you know, c come from a variety of backgrounds, um, a number of them are getting uh, health insurance through a spouse. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are under 26 and still on their parents' plan. So they're getting insurance from a variety of ways. It, um, but for those that didn't have access to insurance or that were relying on insurance from a previous kind of traditional nine to five job, being able to know that they were going to be able to purchase insurance on the individual market was a huge relief for them in kind of getting over that barrier. Thank you. And with the last uh, 40 seconds of my time, Ms. Moses, if you could kind of speak to us a little bit about Freelancers Union and how you've worked with them uh, and whether or not there's anything that the government can learn from that as well. Um, we, don't, we don't currently work with the Freelancers Union. Um, that being said, uh, we, would, we would love to, to, to work with them more, more closely. They are doing some really great things uh, for freelancers in America, including looking at exact policy questions that you've asked today about health care um, and how they will be able to provide that to this huge growing segment of workers that have decided to work this way. Thank you, and I, and I appreciate the time I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Tennessee is now recognized for five minutes. He's not, oh, he stepped out. Okay. All right. The uh, gentlelady from Iowa is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was really excited about the subcommittee hearing today. Uh, I know, obviously, the the gig economy is becoming a, you know, a, a bigger part of, um, well, for millennials like myself and young folks across the country, um, you know, a, a new pathway where we can, you know, get creative about our future. And um, but but it makes it difficult sometimes given uh, the policies that are out there um, and, and folks thinking about retirement and health care and child care and uh, paid family leave and all the things that go into it. So uh, thank you so much for being here and, and chatting about those topics. But I got really excited, uh, Ms. Wallace, when you start talking about marketing. And uh, it took me back to a conversation I recently had uh, with, with some folks back in Iowa when I was doing a small business tour. Um, visited a, a company in Makokara. It's one of our uh, smaller towns uh, that's working really hard on their main streets and, um, you know, trying to keep folks in Makokata and bring them back home. Uh, and the company that I talked to, you know, they had been around for decades and have done a great job. They do commercial washers, but then they also work with other, um, you know, entrepreneurs that come to them and have ideas. Um, you know, the, one of the things I heard about was a gentleman from Cascade, which is a, 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 a even smaller town than Makokata uh, in Iowa, who had an idea for a, a shredding a, a shredding machinery when it, it comes to tearing down houses and uh, just being creative about how they do that more effectively. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, excited that this company was willing to help him create that product and ask then, you know, how is that going? How has he been able to grow? And one of the things we heard that the biggest issue was was the marketing side of it. 
and how he was going to have access to that. Because again, you guys are exactly right. Uh, Ms. Mo Moses and Ms. Wallace and Ms. Blossom, when you are working hard on your business, uh, the last thing you are thinking about uh, when you know, you're filling out all the paperwork, all that is then how do you take that next step? Is there anything that you guys could see the small business development centers or the SBA start getting more involved in to encourage uh, folks to to have access to marketing and uh, take it to the next step? And is there, what, what should we be looking out for here? And is there any, you know, are there any programs that we're missing or things that you think we should be doing that we're not doing, uh, especially when it comes to connecting marketing to the folks who need it? I don't know that there's anything specific that's missing, but I do know that marketing is the very last thing that businesses think about when they're building. They think about creating the app and building the technology and creating the products, et cetera. Um, they open the doors, whether virtually or uh, physically, and wait. Mm. Um, and the whole notion of you know build it and they will come is, is definitely um, not what happens when you start a business. So when they open their business and they wait for customers and then they think, oh yeah, I should probably do that thing called marketing. So yeah. I think the message needs to be um, right when they start, don't forget about this um, major piece. Don't start this major piece you know, at the end, but think about your marketing as part of your entire um, business development now. And I know, uh, Mr. Balderson, you, you touched on this quite a bit too, just uh, how do we better educate folks about the programs that are out there? I know you guys are doing your best, uh, again, being on the ground every day with our entrepreneurs and folks who are you know, taking that next step and that risk, but what more can we be doing as a Congress to make sure that we're educating folks? Ms. Moses or Ms. Blossom? I mean, I, th I think one thing that you could do um, is work with kind of more com like community organizations that are that are talking to businesses. So, so for example, I know for us with Tech New York City, um, that was a resource that we definitely reached out to, and they're very good at disseminating information to technology companies. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure that it's really about knowledge, right? And I think that a lot of small business owners as they're building businesses, like when I first started Hire, it was kind of blinders on me building the business, not looking out and, and figuring out what else is out there to help me. Um, and I think marketing, you're completely right. It's the hardest thing for a small business owner to wrap their head around because you go online and you start reading about all these things you could be doing with AdWords or you know Facebook ads or whatever it might be, and it's overwhelming, so you just don't do anything instead of doing something. Well, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this question is for Ms. Blossom. Uh, small businesses are always at the forefront of what's next because they have to stay ahead of the larger counterparts. What new technology is out there that will make your small business and many small businesses even more accessible to growth? So I, I think that that's a great question. And I think it, it's both about utilizing new technology, but also ex using a lot of the existing technology that's out there and making small businesses see how it can work for them. For example, uh, we were in Colorado and we met two great guys who started a deck building business. And on a whim, they started uh, making YouTube videos of themselves building decks. And now they have tons of followers. They've gotten lots of customers because people are weirdly very interested in watching people watch decks, but they've used you know, social media in a non-traditional way to help build their business. So I think we can encourage companies that might not think that either social media or online presence, it could be important for them business to really kind of expand their reach. And to what my fellow panelists said, use that as a marketing tool to let more customers know about their businesses. Specifically, as someone who's built decks uh, with my own hands, I've never watched a YouTube video of any, perhaps the deck would have been more stable if I had. But you bring a great point, and I'm gonna ask each one of you to address that, if you would for me, please. I come from South Central Pennsylvania, an incredibly rural area where there are over 5,000 farms, and these are all small businesses. Please touch on the importance of accessibility to rural broadband in your particular concerns and in the concerns regarding small businesses throughout your areas. 
Sure. We think broadband is incredibly important because we know that the internet is often the first place that people are turning now when they're looking for businesses. Um, we, we met a person this week who had a lawn care business and he was connected through Thumbtack to his neighbor who lived across the street who didn't know that he had a lawn care business, but because of the internet and because they were able to connect online, they got new customers and, and helped build their business. So making ru rural broadband is incredibly important because we know that that's where everybody's going to turn to make sure that those people are able to access the internet and have an online presence so they're not missing out on potential clients. I, I would echo that sentiment in terms of just that importance of connecting people. Um, we hear from businesses all the time that are outside of large cities about how they would love to be able to access higher. One of the big reasons why we would never, well not never, but why we can't go to some of these smaller communities is that we are an app-based business. So if people don't have access to broadband, they don't have access to potentially even downloading an app or being able to connect them. But sometimes it's those small businesses in rural communities that need a service like hire more than a business that's in you know downtown Manhattan because they do need to access people. So um, I think that making sure that people have access to broadband is, is of upward support, importance across the country. And I would just add to what they've said as far as marketing, connection, but also education. And I think um, I know for myself and for a lot of entrepreneurs, the education that, and training they're receiving, they're finding online. And so when you don't have access to um, even high-speed internet or broadband to stream videos, to learn um, techniques and, and other elements of running your business, then that's a hindrance as well. If I could just add on to, to what she said, um, we've, we also often survey the professionals in the bank and say, you know, when you need information about your business, where do you we turn? Do you turn to the SBA? Do you turn to your local chamber? And increasingly, people are turning to the internet, to Facebook groups, to YouTube videos, to get information from fellows in their industry, and then just other business owners about how to solve challenges that we've talked about throughout this panel. I might just indulge just a few more seconds. If I asked a yes and no question for each one of you, if there was more access to internet through rural broadband expansion and accessibility, would that make your businesses stronger and grow more? It's a yes, no. Yes. 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 Thank you all for being here today. I yield back. Thank you. The uh, gentleman yields back. And I, and I will say with confidence, nobody would want to watch me build a deck on YouTube. <laughs> I can assure you of that. <laughs> the uh, gentlelady from Kansas is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much. I didn't realize there was so much uh, deck building experience here. I've built a couple of decks myself. Oh, we'll, we'll have to talk. Afterwards. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll collaborate on that. Um, so, I, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Chairman Crow, for, uh, for leading this uh, important discussion today. Uh, the digital ecosystem has definitely opened up new opportunities for entrepreneurs and small businesses, um, you know, from founding a startup to uh, existing businesses growing and helping existing businesses. Um, and I think the, the biggest piece that we're seeing here is that... Um, so many people across the country are having access to opportunities to, to start their own businesses. And um, in fact, uh, Susan Cooley, who is, uh, uh, I represent the district um, that, that she has started a business in was, you know, someone who like a lot of folks saw um, a need, you know, she's looking for a, a reasonably priced comforter, right? And then discovers that, that there's a, there's a demand for a specific kind of product and decided to, um, you know, start an uh, eBay store. And I think a lot of people have gone down this path and now has grown that from, you know, uh, offering clothing and accessories and household goods uh, at Sincerely Susan to now having a, a brick and mortar store and having 15 employees. And I think that those are the kinds of, of stories that we need to make sure that we keep in mind as we think about how do we help other folks who are looking to solve a problem, have that entrepreneurial mindset. And um, one of the things that I kind of wanted to follow up on is this, is this concept of uh, broadband and access to broadband. Um, thank you for answering the question because now I get to ask follow-ups to just like pull out a little bit more information. Um, I was wondering if when you think about 
broadband as someone who, as folks who actually are like helping benefit other um, small business owners, do you, do you find that you're kind of like waving your arms and saying broadband is important? Or do you feel like there are a lot of people who, um, who are also recognizing that, that, you know, oh, I would definitely start a business if I had access? Or is this an in- instance where we need to be uh, getting out there and explaining to people that small businesses would grow if if there were more broadband access? Does this make sense? Um, Ms. Wallace, I'd I think so. Um, my first in, you know, instinct on that and thought is that people are aware that it's important. Um, and I have heard too, um, we have a lot of kind of rural areas in Colorado that, you know, if, if the, I had broadband or if I had, you know, reliable internet, then I would be able to do these things. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that if that we have to wave our hands, I, I, I would think that people know that, um, it's needed. Yeah. I ask, so one of the reasons I ask is because a lot of times I, I think what ends up happening is, um, that especially legislators and lawmakers make a lot of assumptions about what people already know. Um, and as the, as the small business committee, uh, I think, and, you know, we're focused on, on innovation and the, and workforce development is how do we make sure that folks, um, have access to information, um, if rural broadband is, is a huge issue and, you know, the, the Congress now knows about it, it tells me that there's probably a lot of people on the ground who are in the weeds doing the work that, that, um, have been trying to sound the alarm for a long time. Um, one of the things I'm wondering about is whether or not any of you have made use of the SBA programs, whether it was small business development centers, um, loan programs, and then as a follow-up, have your, uh, whether they're customers or folks that you're um, helping connect, um, are they making use of them? Because I often hear that people didn't realize that there was this, there was this available. We'll start with Ms. Boss. Sure. Um, we, we know that we, we have a hu- hundreds of thousands of professionals, and we know that many of them are using SBA, but we also know that it's probably underutilized. And so we're open to all ideas on ways that we can better educate people about the different resources that are available. Because, you know, as we've spoken, time is the biggest resource for small business owners, and they're often so frenzied that they don't know that small the SBA would be a resource for them to look to. So, you know, anything we can do on the education front to just let them know about the array of services, I think would be really helpful. And I, so to tie those two things together, the reason I ask that is because uh, when access to uh, access to information is so reliant on on broadband access or internet access. You know, the small business development centers can be a place where people might might be able to make use of that. Um, so that's why I was curious. How how much are you seeing use of that in your um, in your work? And I don't know if uh, Ms. Wallace or Ms. Moses had anything additional. And the uh, the general lady's time has expired. Oh, but we will, okay. Uh, no, thank you. We will I go. Appreciate we will have a, a second round of questions. Thank you for too, giving so me you the can, extra you can, uh, twenty-five hold seconds. That, I appreciate that. Hold that question and thought. Um, I, I will recognize the uh, gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you have thank some you, questions. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, look, uh, uh, thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member, for holding this here, and I really appreciate it. And um, I, I actually might be following up on some of that, but um, you know, I've been deeply interested in the, um, the innovative ways that small businesses can use digital services to grow and adapt to an ever-changing tech landscape. It's something that I hear a lot about um, from folks in my own district as they're uh, trying to figure this out and as we're talking about <clears throat> things that we can be doing on infrastructure and other things, that making sure that we're looking out for broadband, um, and how that's going to impact. So, um, you know, Ms. Wallace, I just want to start with you. Um, you know, you shared ways that small businesses can use digital tools to help them reach more customers. Um, can you explain how the evolution of digital marketing has benefited small businesses in particular? Sure. When I started doing marketing, um, I worked with really big clients that had millions of dollars to do traditional media, to buy TV ads and newspaper ads. Um, Today, um, relying on simply traditional media would be impossible for small businesses. So now, allowing myself and clients to be able to buy Facebook ads for, you know, a hundred dollars, or do a YouTube video, or do even YouTube ads, or boost posts on Pinterest, um, allow them to reach a um, broad 
yet targeted audience for a fraction of the cost. Um, so that has changed tremendously uh, over the last 10 years and even over the last couple years. You mentioned, um, you know, Facebook and YouTube as some of these different platforms. What are some of the other platforms that you've seen been successful either in your own work and your family's businesses? Um, I'd just be, you know, just get a better sense of that. And, and how critical is it, you know, to having that social media presence for small businesses mm -hmm. now? Um, you know, I could go on and on about um, LinkedIn as well as I, I mentioned Pinterest already, constant contact and MailChimp as far as email marketing and tying that back to social media. Um, the list goes on and I would say it's 100% um, critical to the success of businesses and the growth of businesses to have an online presence and specifically have a social media presence. Um, Ms. Blossom, over to you. I, I, you know, we're at this point now where you know you have billions of users, you know, accessing these digital platforms on their phones and on their computers. You know, as uh, as these digital platforms gain users, what can small businesses do to try to stand out amongst the crowd? You know, how is it that they can kind of penetrate through and, and make their mark? Absolutely. So I think. Um as people turn more and more to the internet, they expect more and more information. And one of the most important things that we can do as a platform is give small businesses the tools to put as much relevant information online and in a searchable format as we can. So they can upload fit, uh, photos of your work. If you're a wedding photographer, you're gonna wanna put lots of examples um, on your profile and you may not have the money to create your own multimedia website. You know, If you're a personal trainer, you might put videos of how you've worked with other clients on there so people looking to, at your business might find to see if you are a good fit. And so it's incredibly important. And I think one of the great things about digital tools is it lets people know that there's other options than traditional big businesses. If you had a plumbing emergency and you thought to yourself, I, I don't know where to get a plumber, you might think, oh, I'll just call Roto-Rooter because I've heard of them or seen the commercial. But if you went online and searched plumbers near me, you'd find Thumbtack and then you might get 10 to 15 options of small businesses that could do the job, perhaps chick quicker and more efficiently. And so opening people's ideas up to other small business options that they might not have thought of is one of the best things about the internet. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly talking to um, some businesses in my district uh, as I went around earlier this week, I mean, I think that's something that they were trying to figure out is, you know, how do they, how do they get that word out? How do they just, you know, get that connection with folks? Um, and the ones that have been successful have been ones that have been able to kind of build a community around them you know, be able to use these platforms to be able to really accentuate and create that, not only loyalty in terms of customers, but um, what I found really exciting was just really seeing the camaraderie and the connectedness between small business owners themselves, you know, using these platforms to be able to highlight each other and, and really trying to, you know, create that kind of atmosphere. So I'm certainly, you know, still trying to learn some of these best practices, um, and I appreciate all of you coming out and, and sharing some of those with us. Um, I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, at this time, I'd like to just start a, a brief second round of questioning. I think there's a few follow-ups that uh, we all have that we'd like to dive into a little bit more. Uh, uh, so I will, I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, and I wanted to pick up on something that um, uh, the ranking member, Mr. Balderson, uh, alluded to earlier, and it's a concern that I share. Uh, he brought up the issue of uh, digital privacy regulations, and this is part of a broader issue that we have this tendency to treat all businesses the same with respect to regulations and rules. And, and yet we know uh, that a small and medium-sized business has uh, had a much harder time bearing the costs and the, and the burdens of, of compliance than a Fortune 500 company does. So specifically with regard to uh, data privacy, uh, whether you all have any experiences with uh, uh, compliance and the costs of those and how that might have uh, impeded your growth, uh, and then more generally, if you had experiences with regulations that could be more appropriately scaled to your businesses and kind of where you are in your, your growth cycle. I think you very accurately summarized that with data privacy regulation, we obviously support the goals. And you know, for our businesses to succeed, people have to feel comfortable using the internet and feel comfortable that uh, companies like ours and other actors are going to take good care of their their information. Um, but you know, the the big. Uh, companies, they're going to be able to do it. They're going to be able to hire enough compliance uh, experts and lawyers, and they have the means to do so. Um, for kind of mid-sized companies like Thumbtack and even the small businesses that we serve, um, some of these data privacy regulations 
while very well intended and have you know good goals, are going to be incredibly cumbersome. And particularly, as we mentioned before, like if there are 50 different sets of data privacy regulations, it will essentially prevent small and medium businesses from operating across state lines because they just won't be able to spend as enough resources on compliance information as they need to. I would echo those sentiments in terms of just uh, us ourselves as hires a company, we're still growing. Um, we're very diligent in terms of the data that we collect because as you can imagine, we're collecting data on people's, um, where they're working, their shifts, even geolocations of, of where workers are going. Uh, and we're very, you know, again, diligent about keeping that information and making sure that it's very uh, intact. But as, as, more regulations are put on us, it could impede our growth in terms of what we would potentially have to report, how would we would do that, you know, having to hire new technology people just to comply with those regulations. Uh, so I think most companies want to ensure that we're, we're compliant with people's privacy informations, but just considering that when regulations are being built at, at the federal level would be, um, would be a great thing. And just quickly to add to that, at, at one point in time years ago, as um, you know, building websites and having people have an e-commerce website, they had to process credit cards through their own processor in the back end. And now we're able to uh, heavily rely on third parties to do that processing for us. So um, I'll use my daughter as an example. She's selling books at a school fair and she's using Square. We rely on Square to have um, the capability to keep data safe. Um, and we also rely on Square to have the lawyers and the ability to fight that when needed, because, knowing that we wouldn't be able to if it was, re it was um, um, placed on the shoulders of the small business owner themselves. Thank you, all of you. And uh, Ms. Omega Wallace, I have this feeling that I will someday be working for your daughter. So <laughs> very impressive uh, young woman. Uh, I will now uh, yield to uh, Mr. Uh, Balderson, uh, the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Wallace, and, and I was appreciative of the, the chairman. That was a great question. Um, so I'm old school. I, I'm in my late 50s. I'm that end of that baby boomer line. Uh, and for me to buy online is a challenge. Uh, it's for me. I like to still touch that piece, that shirt I want to buy or that piece of equipment I want to buy. You've been doing this for a long time. Obviously, as, as Chairman Crow said, your daughter now, I'll probably be dealing with her or my son will. Uh, and my son gets on me about not being able to buy online yet, and he's 32, and he, that's the only way he does business. Um, tell me the difference. When you encourage folks to get into this online business compared to the bricks and mortar stores that we're seeing uh, decreasing uh, more and more. Um, I can no longer buy a dress shirt in my hometown because the last dress shop just closed. I say dress shop, men's shop. Uh, that, you, you know, it, and it's a struggle. So tell me the advantages to why it, this is all happening. I know the low cost, but give me some other ideas that you encourage some of your clients to, to go online for. When you go online, you expand your territory by leaps and bounds. So um, I actually work with quite a few brick and mortar um, businesses in Denver, Colorado, who are um, limited to that corridor or that neighborhood in their brick and mortar. Going online opens up a whole new world literally to them to be able to scale and be able to um, overall increase revenue. Also, as a as a consultant or as a service provider, if I'm doing consulting one-on-one, -on -one, I max out my time after um, I meet with five people in a day. Whereas if I can go online and expand that to a group setting or have you know a Facebook group and do um, live chats with groups of people, I can grow and expand my business um, and move out of that one-to-one -one service. All right. You almost sold me, but not quite, but thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Balderson. I can't help the fact that you're old school, though. Are there? Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. The gentleman yields back. I will now recognize uh, the gentlelady from Kansas for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I know the the issue around privacy Again, I'm just like, this is awesome. I, I love the 
I can just do follow-ups. What are some specific uh, measures, or I don't know if there's already uh, policy or legislative ideas that are being put out there that you could share with us about how we take into account compliance for uh, the the much smaller businesses and um, how we make sure that we're not um, impeding people from being able to to do the kind of business that that we definitely need because you know if you're when you were talking about depending on square to really adhere to privacy concerns um, you know I think that there's some probably like lines of liability that we could be talking about but are there some specific uh, pieces of uh, policy that you think that we need to know about here? Uh, what we've seen in some of the state bills and some of the uh, frameworks that we have seen coming out of Congress is uh, different thresholds for um, compliance on the privacy, um, either a revenue threshold or an employee number threshold that would really help the smallest businesses, you know, depending upon where that threshold is set, um, you know, think about privacy as they're getting grow bigger and hopefully as they grow, they will then be part of that compliance scheme. Um, but give it, giving uh, some help to the really small ones who might not hit those thresholds yet. I think that thresholds on employee numbers um, as well as potentially even like revenue numbers. I need, I, for us, um, much like uh, you use uh, Square, we use Stripe. Stripe is actually used by most big tech platforms now uh, so that we're not collecting any financial information from any of the workers on our platform. Uh, everything is actually dealt through them and that is a huge help for us as a business because we don't have to deal again with any of those that financial information. Um, I think it more comes down to when you're collecting people's uh, you know, addresses, their telephone numbers, even when we're thinking about the geolocation of the workers that we're, we're carrying from, um, that kind of stuff could get uh, potentially cumbersome if we're, if we're looking at different types of legislation that could be coming up. And I would just agree with what they both said. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, the gentlelady yields back. I will now um, recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do want to thank Chairman Crow, and I want to thank Ranking Member Balderson for bringing you in front of us here today. I think that I learned something from what you presented to us. Small business is a bipartisan advocate for you. And I've often said that we're bridge builders, but today I've changed that. We are deck builders with, <laughs> with Representative Davids, that we understand the importance of working together. We are your service providers. That's your take home message from me today. We work here with both sides of the aisles unencumbered to advocate for the small businesses in the United States. Now I'd like to finish with a pop quiz, but I'll tell you there's no wrong answer. It's a question for each one of you and it's important for me to take home. Now as someone who didn't finish their formal education until I was in my early 30s, I'm used to pop quizzes, and you might not have thought this was gonna to happen to you today, but I'd like to allow you to indulge me, please. Regarding the growth of your individual companies, if you had to choose between one of the three following, which would you choose? Again, I'll preface by saying there's no wrong answer. Would you ask for more capital for that growth? Would you ask for better broadband access for your companies for that growth? Or would you ask for better access to trade associations? So better broadband, better, more capital, or better access to trade associations? What works best for you? I'll start with you, please, Ms. Blossom. Um, it's a very interesting question. I think uh, for us, um, we, we are lucky um, to, to have the capital that we need to grow. And so broadband would actually be interesting because we don't know how many potential Thumbtack service providers and customers are out there that aren't using our platform or aren't aware of the opportunities because they don't have access. Um, for, so for us, that's really an unknown and a very interesting question that we would love to explore. So Ms. Moses, it's your chance to 
tell us why these are important to you and which is the most important? Um, I think it's a great question for us at our stage at our business capital. Um, we're at this point in our business turning down business because we don't have enough capital in order to hire enough people to service all of the small businesses that want to use us to access labor. Uh, but we're in a unique position because we are a growing tech company. And so if you usually ask any growing tech company, capital will be number one. Um, but I think, I think all three are important for businesses to grow in America. Thank you. Ms. Wallace. Um, we're in an interesting situation, but also a situation that a lot of uh, business owners face is that my husband's income and my income is the same income from our business that we bring in. So I would have to say capital because right at this moment, we're at a place where we're juggling three contractors and bringing in the right amount of business to be able to pay them, pay ourselves, pay our mortgage. And so it is a very tricky balance of cash flow. So capital would be helpful so that we can scale, grow more, bring on uh, more people and help provide marketing to more small businesses. Thank you all, and thank you for being here today. Chairman Crow. I yield my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and I'll say, uh, John, this deck joke is going to be good for a long time. I can tell. <laughs> I would like to thank all of the witnesses for sharing their time with us today. Uh, digital platforms provide transformative resources for entrepreneurs to build and grow businesses. That's very clear from our discussion today. Uh, the collaboration fostered through digital ecosystems has improved both the cost and efficiency of digital marketing and employment. These uh, cost and time savings are particularly helpful for small businesses that are burdened with tight budgets and limited resources. Uh, but small businesses cannot unlock these opportunities if they fail to adopt digital tools. That's why the members of this committee must raise the awareness of the value of digital platforms and encourage small businesses to become active participants in the ecosystem, but also identify ways to lower the hurdles as well and, and, and not uh, have us stand in the way of your entrepreneurship and your growth. Uh, I, would, I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. And without objection, that's so ordered. If there's no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Congratulations on the first congressional committee. That's well done. Appreciate it.